Hello, everyone. We are live now. I saw some uh, folks chatting about how there was no sound. Hopefully you can see and hear us now. We are live. I'm so excited to be here for this panel today. My name is Candace Huber. I am the owner of Tubby and Coos Mid-City Bookshop in New Orleans, Louisiana. And I am a huge fan of genre fiction. The store is a genre fiction store. Um, so sci-fi fantasy romance mashups are some of my favorite things ever. And so I was just saying, I'm going to try really hard not to totally just like geek out too hard <laughs> with these authors, but I'm very, very excited um, to be here today. So I'm going to let the authors introduce themselves and talk a little bit, give you maybe a fun fact um, and talk a little bit about their newest books. So we will, we will start there. So who wants to go first? You better just assign someone. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, Travis, I'm going to pick on you. You go first. Oh, God. Um, so I'm the one that really doesn't belong here. Um, oh, I'm that's not normally an audiobook narrator. Um, I'm the author of Legends and Lattes. It's the only book I've ever finished writing. I, I feel like I snuck in the back door. Um, <laughs> uh, so, yeah, as I said, I normally I, I narrate a lot of audiobooks. And... Uh, uh, Legends of Lattes was my National Novel Writing Month book last year, um, and uh, it has been a very interesting ride. So, <laughs> and the book is awesome, and I hope a lot of people have read it. And uh, I know you sold a lot of copies of it, so congratulations on that too. <laughs> Thanks. It's been a very different year, a very unexpected year. Yeah. Yes. yes. <laughs> Rachel, how about you? Okay. Um, hi, I'm Rachel. My book is my debut. It's one dark window. It's a a dark fantasy with definite romance, and it's not out yet. Twenty seventh in the U.S. and the twenty ninth in the U.K. Rachel is breaking up and now completely frozen for me, Rachel. Yeah, for me as well. Okay. Rachel's book is called One Dark yeah. Window, in case you didn't hear, and it comes out September the 27th in the U.S. and I believe the 29th in the U.K. Um, so hopefully Rachel <laughs> comes back <laughs> after that. Um, so uh, Alexandra. Hi, I'm Alexandra Rowland. I have written eight books. Uh, my uh, fourth traditionally published book uh, comes out in 10 days. Oh my God. Uh, it is A Taste of Golden Iron, which uh, of course is a fantasy romance. Uh, it's about an exquisitely beautiful prince uh, who has chronic anxiety <laughs> and his uh, hot, stoic, beefy bodyguard. Uh, and they uh, solve a coin counterfeiting plot and fall in love. And yes, it is a kissing book. Um, we were asked to tell uh, one like weird, cool fact about ourselves that isn't in our bios. Uh, so my weird fact is that I've done every fiber art that you can name and uh, some that you can't. That's pretty cool. <laughs> and of course, last but not least, Hello, I think she means us. I think she means us. Yeah, unfortunately. Oh yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I said it. That you may not have heard. Yes. <laughs> um, well, we're Gordon and Alona Andrews. Um, we write books. Latest book comes out on Tuesday. Uh, what it's else? It's a kissing is? book. It's a kissing book. Yeah. It has romance. Um, so yeah, that's about it. And I have. Big, in apropos of nothing, I have a small dog named Tubby. Oh, do you? <laughs> yes. That's so cool. He's, he's he's not allowed to be down here right now because unfortunately it does turn into the Tubby show. Yes. But he's a French bulldog. So yeah, that's that's our cool fact. But I also wanted to mention um, Seal Polk, the other basically author who was on this panel, was supposed to be here. She had some technical difficulties at the last moment, but her books are awesome. If you get a chance, please check them out. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Please do. Um, and Witchmark was one of my, that series was really great, but um, they have another book, a novella coming out as well. Um, a little bit later, I, I don't remember exactly when it's coming out, um, 
but it is also going to be really good. So definitely check out their work as well. Midnight Bargain was good too. So just anything by CL Polk is <laughs> great. Go get it. Um, and I also forgot to mention earlier um, that if you want to ask a question, you can do that. There's the ask a question button at the bottom um, and we may or may not get to those. And then also you can buy any of these books. There's a buy books button. So of course, that's why we're all here. Happy Bookstore Romance Day. Um, and so the first question that I have for y'all, um, because we're here to talk about the mashup of sci-fi, fantasy, and romance. And a lot of people say that romance is formulaic, right? Um, everyone knows sort of the formula that goes into romance. Um, SFF, uh, putting those two together, how do you put your own spin on that romance formula um, to, I don't know, put the SFF stuff in there and, and make it your own? Yeah, uh, if I, I can go first. Um, go ahead. Yeah, I, romance is formulaic in the same way that a recipe is formulaic, right? And so every person who bakes a cake, for example, is going to bake a slightly different cake just because of the uh, recipe that they used, or even if they all use the same recipe, there's the um, the environment that it was cooked in, uh, the condition of their oven, and um, just all of the individual them specific stuff that goes into it. Um, and that's the same with, with a romance novel, right? And so the stuff that makes it unique and yours is all the stuff that comes from you. It's the tropes that you want to emphasize. It's the voice that you use. It's the uh, amount of time that you spend building the characters. Um, and I really think that characters are obviously like what drive uh, romance most more than anything. So I don't know, I'm not, so I like, I'm an, I'm an audio book narrator and I don't narrate romance normally. So, and romance isn't my normal genre. So, but I like it when it comes my way. So I don't, I don't feel like I have the same sort of comprehensive idea of all of the, the beats and tropes that appear in romance this, to the same extent that people who write it really regularly do and who read it really regularly do. So I also almost feel like my book is just barely romance like it just edged in again it snuck in the side door almost um because i ended up just writing what i wanted as an alternative to what i normally read out loud every day for hundreds of days every year which was something that wasn't about people dying that wasn't about high octane action scenes it was just about people who were generally being kind to each other and relating to each other and building relationships over the course of a book and the romance actually i didn't expect to happen until i got to it it was just i knew these two people would become good friends that they would be building a relationship that would be based on like mutual support and then the romance just sort of accidentally happened so it's i feel like i came into it a very strange direction Rachel or Lona Gordon? Um, I'm sorry. I cut out. Can you see me on that? Can you see me? Yes, we can yeah. see you okay. and hear you. Amazing. I didn't catch the, the, the question. Oh, the I question was, was uh, with the r romance and, and sci-fi sort of mashup that you all do, romance is kind of formulaic. There's a formula that people sort of expect from it. And I was just wondering how you put your own spin on that formula in writing your sci-fi fantasy romance mashup? That's a great question. Um, and for me, romance, romance is like the thing I am most excited to write in the story. However, it is almost always a second thread to what is actually going on. And I find, um, and maybe it's just me, but I like some of the predictability of romance stories and that like, I know what characters are probably going to be together just by their earliest interactions. So like, I like that predictability. However, for me, it works the best in fantasy because fantasy, you can go anywhere with it. You can write really like stories that, that have no predictability. And, and so I like, I like the formula sometimes I like the tropes because 
they fit well in a world that you can completely turn topsy turvy or subvert expectations of what will actually happen to these characters in fantasy. Um, yeah, so I like the formula. <laughs> I think we anyone who reads romance will like the formula. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> yeah <we do. laughs> Luna and Gordon. Um, how do we put the spin, our own spin on romance? Um, badly. <laughs> we put it badly. Um, I mean, honestly, I think it's just when you say romance, I think of relationships. You know, the beginning of relationships, you know, the the maintaining of relationships in the sense. And I mean, they could be romantic or not romantic. If, if they're romantic, then, yeah. you know, I mean, I, I just think mainly for us, we kind of think about the two characters that we, we want to bring together, or we have a character and we think of someone we would want to put them with. Mm -hmm. Like we're kind of doing that with our, our theoretical next part of our Hidden Legacy series, yeah. deciding who to hook up our, the younger sister. Yes, it's, it's funny yeah. because readers complained that two characters had similar names. So now there's several characters named Michael. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be this Michael, possibly that Michael. I'm trying to figure out how if to... If we can name a third person. Michael, Michael, somehow, we will be all set. Yeah. Yeah. Um, honestly, people make a big deal out of the formula in romance, but really there's only two things. Uh, it must be, have a love story. It must have an H.A. That's it. There's nothing else. Everything else is up to the author. So, hey, that's it. I have said my piece. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree. I, I think like, you know, a lot of us read romance because we want that happy ending. We want that formula. Like we know, okay, these people are going to end up together no matter what the journey, it's going to be a happy ending and it's fine. And that's why we read it, right? The world sucks and <laughs> we, we want to see a happy ending. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that's why a lot of people gravitate towards these kinds of books too, um, because of, all of that really because the world is terrible <laughs> um and so what what are the most important story elements in romance and sci-fi fantasy like what do you have to make sure you get in there um to meet the expectations of both romance and sci-fi fantasy readers because they have different sort of expectations um when they come to a story but you're doing both things. So how are you balancing that? I, I feel like um, fantasy readers tend to be more okay with you. And this is just from like my perception and like what I have noticed. Um, fantasy readers, uh, from what I have seen, tend to be more okay with you throwing weird shit at them or um, like doing something a little experimental or uh, changing up the pattern, whereas romance readers very much want that, um, want you to follow the recipe, right? Like they want to know what cake they're getting at the end. <laughs> um, so I think the biggest part for me is just balancing um, the expectation of newness and innovation and um, uh, fantasy or fantasy readers really want to be introduced to a new world or a new magic system or something that they have never uh, imagined before. Uh, so you have to balance sort of that expectation of the novel uh, in the sense of new things with the expect or with the expectation of um, sort of the reliable beats that you know are going to happen uh, in the order roughly that they are expected to happen. Um, and of course, as uh, Ilona said, you absolutely do need a, a happy ending. Um, I would love for romance to sort of broad, I would love to see a romance structured book or rather more romance structured books that have relationship arcs that again, are shaped according to the romance arc, um, but don't have romance in the way that we that the broad cultural sort of understanding is because for example i would love to see more romance structured novels about um asexual people or people in queer platonic relationships um where this absolutely is a romance but it doesn't include the sexual aspect if that makes sense i would just love to see um because i i love romances so much i love the exploration of those deep, intense relationships. But I would love to see like more kinds of relationships, um, if that makes sense. 
It does. I'm right there with you. I agree with a lot of that. Um, I think in fantasy and romance and making sure you hit the beats of both, um, it is a balance. And it can be hard for someone like me who, like, I just want to write the romance scenes half the time. But I, I really think um, the world building and the magic system, at least in, in my book, um, that's the part where, yes, it hi it will highlight these two characters in my in my story of and their love story, but the the world building and the fantastical elements are a character themselves. And that is something that I find to be essential in the fantasy genre. Um, so while it is a story about characters, the world itself becomes one too. And finding the balance of those. Um, as far as romance goes, mostly what I want out of romance as a reader or a listener is I want to feel good at the end of it. I want like, I think of them as like chicken soup books, which is one of the reasons I'm always happy to get them when I'm narrating is because I feel good after I'm done. It's really nice. Um, but as far as fantasy goes, what I like with fantasy when married with other things is when it's used the same way almost that sci-fi is used to talk about something. Sci-fi is usually used to talk about like a cultural thing or like, uh, you know, a larger like societal concept, like Star Trek really likes to do that sort of thing. And I like fantasy in the context of romance when it talks about human things in a way that it's not as easy to talk about when you're just talking about humans. Like you can take a concept and you can push it further about how people relate in different ways using the trappings of fantasy in the same way that you can use sci-fi or another, you know, kind of genre fiction to do that sort of thing. I guess to me that we, we're sitting there and we're analyzing it and pulling it apart and picking it to death. But the thing is, when you're actually writing it, it's more of an organic process. For us, um, kind of the world comes, I don't want to say comes first, but the world and the main character are um, integrated. They're linked. Um, so... When we, when we create a character, it's like, well, what are they doing for a living? What forced them into that position? Who would that character like? So there's not really this artificial separation of like, I want to put this important concept into it. Or, you know, I, probably that's why we write popcorn. But, um, you know, I think that romance overall as a genre tends to be very broad and very accepting. You don't have to look far. You can find the asexual romances. You can find the romances with very low level of heat. Um, you can find romances where it is not um, two people, but maybe more. Um, you can find romances where it's not people, it's aliens. Uh, you know, if you count Chuck Tingle as romance, oh, you, you go really broadly with that. But uh, overall, romance, um, as long as you give people a love story and it ends well, is very, very accepting. I mean, uh, people just, like you said, people just want to feel good. You know, they want to, we don't always get an H.A. in real life. But in romance, it's a guarantee and we love it for it, right? Yeah, I, for me, I need that, I need adversity. Like the couple has to face adversity. There have to be barriers or reasons for them not to be together because otherwise it's just hey we got together and it's fine there's like there's no big deal like what i think of is the film lady hawk where she's a hawk and he's literally a wolf but like a different yeah and it, it's the barrier is enormous and they're, how they're do together. you have a relationship they're always together they're together for years but i don't think even obviously the relationship is, is consummated but you get an hea at the end they there's a yeah. there's a lot of like battles, literal battles and stuff they have to go through. But they to get, earn it, kind but of. But they earn it, yeah. In the end, they get to be together. Yeah, and, and that's, are, you know, it's a very old I don't think movie. anybody would argue it's not a romance. It's it clearly a romance. romance. In fact, it's a classic. Yeah. You know, it, it's something that people reference again and again and again in their work. So, yeah, for us, it's kind of an organic process. And, you know, um, romance welcomes all. It really, really kind of does. Yeah. People are freaking out about Lady Hawk in the chat. 
They're like, yes, Lady Hawk. So just, just to let you know, there's a lot of Lady Hawk fans there. I'm so glad you brought that up because it is a romance and that's such a good example. And I think what I personally like about fantasy and sci-fi romance is that you get sort of the the stone or like the grounding of the romance where like you kind of know this is where this is going but you have all this other stuff going on around it that you don't know right and so it's like you get all of this like fantastical things where like other aspects of the plot even like you have no idea what's happening but like i know what's going to happen with this so it's sort of to me grounds it a lot of the time because it's like oh i know what's happening here even though there's other stuff going on that I may not be happy about, I know this will be okay. And so it sort of helps me when I'm reading um, to have that one element that I can like know is okay, even though nothing else might be <laughs> at the end. Um, but also I think I, I wanna talk about this whole like romance and sci-fi fantasy really are typically like just dismissed by a lot of people as like trashy or escapism or whatever. Um, owning a genre store, I, I see it a lot where people come in and they're like, oh, this is a store for kids or whatever. And I'm like, no, it's really not. Um, so it's not serious, right? Like this is just a, a thing that happens. So I, I think these genres though tell like higher truths about humanity. Um, they challenge systems, like they show us what the world could be like, right? They can show us a different path. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are about romance and sci-fi, like why this happens with them just getting dismissed as whatever. Um, and like what you think these genres bring to the table, clearly you all write them. So you have some sort of, you think they have some sort of value. So I'm just wondering what you all think of that. Well, if, uh, if it's trashy and escapism, to write this, then that's what I am. Because, <laughs> but I, I don't believe, you know, I, I think, uh, I don't think there's any sort of morality judgment on wanting to write something that makes you happy, um, and therefore I don't think there should any be some, I don't know, a classicist view of it either. Um, uh, these have been the books that I have always read, and I, I read a lot. Um, I mean. I read a lot, but I, I read in school, like I majored in uh, in English and those sort of things you have to read broadly. And I feel that I just still come back to um, these stories that you're right, even if they do have a guaranteed happy ending, they can just as poignantly talk about really hard issues. Um, but I don't think we have to suffer along with the hardship um, in the world. Like I do believe that by looking at something difficult with the lens of it could end well, or these characters could overcome great adversity. I think I just, there's a lot of value in that in and of itself. Um, and that it ties the, into like why these books are so popular, I believe. Um, yeah. I don't feel like you should have to clear a really high bar for value. If it helps somebody get through their day or just makes them feel better at the end of the day, then it was worth it. There's nothing, I mean, what's bad about that? There's nothing bad about that. And a good story can come from anywhere, from any genre. It just, then the range is going to be so enormous, but it doesn't have to be the great American novel or, a, you know, the best novel of the year. As long as somebody out there got something out of it and it worked for them and fulfilled a need for them, great. It did all it had to do. Totally. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Like, um, I think when we ask the question, like, why is it looked down upon uh, science fiction and fantasy and also romance? Um, I think like this is a problem that we have in the whole of our society is that um, we so devalue and look down upon simple joy, right? And maybe it comes from like a Puritan thing where like if you feel good, then you're like committing a sin of some sort. Um, but yeah, like we have this whole culture in our society that thinks that, um, like things that feel good are bad. And if you're making something that's intended to make people feel good, then that's like cheap entertainment and not serious. Uh, and the only reason, the only way that something can qualify as serious liter serious literature, uh, is if it 
sucks and it sucks in the sense of like emotionally right uh makes you feel bad that makes you just sort of like feel beaten down by the like harsh gray boulder of the world um rather than lifting you up and uh someone in here said oh i think it was one of the questions that you asked earlier uh was about like showing us the way that the the world could be um and this was something that i thought a lot about while i was writing a taste of golden iron because i set out to write just a book that was like as purely self-indulgent as possible with the emphasis on self like it has all of my favorite tropes in it and I used to tell people before I got the book deal, like years before I got the book deal, uh, I used to tell people, yes, I'm rewriting this for the fifth time. Um, I don't know if I'll ever, ever sell this book, but it doesn't matter because I've already gotten paid in joy, just from the joy of spending time with these characters and spending time on stories that make me happy. Uh, and that was a really wonderful part of the process. It can be just as like, healing and enlightening and and uplifting for the the writer as much as it can for the reader <coughs> well i think people who sneer at romance and science fiction or speculative genre in general um kind of typically don't read it um it's not their cup of tea Romance has been doing some really heavy lifting for years. Um, issues of consent, issues of basically what constitutes a relationship, who should get, you know, to be blunt, who should get pleasure during sexual act. How are we going to work around, you know, um, um, issues of, of control and what constitutes a hero, what constitutes a heroine. You know, um, while science fiction has been, you know, pushing the boundaries for a very, very long time, um, not everybody's comfortable with that. Um, and some people, you know, when they're not comfortable with something, their instinctual reaction is to devalue it. Because science fiction, fantasy, they kind of make you think. And a lot of times they offer a mirror to the existing world, they'd show somewhat twisted reflection of it, but that's kind of the point. Um, so yeah, I'm, I am not worried about the future of either fantasy or romance or science fiction. It's there to stay. Um, it's basically mainstream now. Um, if somebody sneers, eh. I think you should get to read whatever you want, whatever makes you happy. Um, the last couple of years have been pretty rough, you yeah. know, for a lot of people. Um, and I think, for me, when I think about it, I think of like things that were popular during the Great Depression. People would go and see comedies, escapism, something that, because, I, okay, if I'm in that period, I don't want to see like a really dark, terrible movie about a bread line, or I want to like see something that's different than that. Um, yeah. And honestly, for me, I would rather like if, if, if we could be in one of two things, like we had a book and someone, kid was forced to read it in class or someone went to a bookstore to buy it because they just wanted to read it, it would be the latter for me every single time. Like I, I just rather someone read our book because- They want to, yeah. They wanted to. To, to kind of put the personal spin on it. So a few years ago, um, our oldest daughter started getting headaches and we couldn't figure out the, the cause of headaches. She was hospitalized. They thought she had meningitis. It was just a horrible, horrible ordeal. And so at some point, I remember she just, she did not sleep. The entire night was horrible. And I'm literally sitting with her on the bed and I'm waiting. I need to wait for about an hour before I can get her to our primary care doctor, who was at that point was the last hope. Um, and so we, you know, here I am and she is just, she's in pain. She can't do anything. She's just laying there. And that hour, by this point, just, we had nothing left emotionally. Nobody in the family had anything left. And so, and I grabbed Eliza James book, which is just a classic romance. She writes Regency, you know, lots of dukes, lots of gowns, nice stuff. And I was able to unplug for that one hour and be functional when it was time to take her to the doctor. 
It turned out, well, we found the issue and it's no longer a problem, but I will remember that till the day I die because at the point where I really, really needed it, that book saved me because I don't know if I would have made it through that hour without a nervous breakdown. So that's the primary point of fiction, the, at least the kind of fiction we write, is that when you're at your lowest, we come and we take you away for a little bit. I, at least that's my take on it. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. And I, I also think it's weird that like only certain types of fiction is considered escapist because it's like, don't we all read books just in general, <laughs> like to escape life? I don't know. I that's that's just why I, I like reading books to escape life. Um, I mean, I guess nonfiction, I'm not, but like you read fiction because you want to get in, into a story, right? <laughs> like that any kind of fiction. Um, and so I always find that funny that it's like oh this is escapist but this isn't like everything is it's fine it's just reading it's okay you you just hallucinate looking at trees it's fine that's, that's what reading is um but there's a question here from the audience that i think is we've sort of touched on it um but what do you foresee with genre in the future right like things have been changing a lot in a very short period of time i think um but things always change, especially in sci-fi fantasy, um, also with romance. So do you see it, do you see these genre fiction, particularly romance, because I think it's more sort of inherent sci-fi fantasy, but what do you think about how it's going to look in another decade? Like, do you see, is there, well, do you think there'll be more inclusion? Do you think we'll have more, like Alexandra was talking about earlier, different kinds of romance? Like, I don't know, just what do you think will happen? <laughs> Theories. Yeah, I, I love the, the current trend. Um, obviously, there's still a long way to go. But um, looking back, even like five or seven or 10 years ago, where we were then versus where we are now, um, there's so much more breadth to see. Um, there, I, I remember a time um, 10 years ago where if someone told me that a book had queer characters in it, for example, I would almost like mandatorily have to read that book because it felt like there was so little content out there of um, those stories. And now there's enough of them that I can pick and choose between them. And I, um, what a luxury to not have to read every single queer book that gets published, you know? That's a, a incredibly joyful thing. Um, I would love to see uh, more uh, diversity in queerness, more diversity in uh, race and um, all the other aspects of, of existing that there are in the world. Um, and I, so I, I very much hope that in the future, the trend just like continues on the, the path that we're on right now. Um, I agree with that. I, I don't have an answer to this question, but I certainly love um, genre bending. I love, like I said, the formula, but in a whole, like wearing a whole lot of different hats. And I hope we continue to move towards more diversified stories across the board. And, and I agree, like it is very interesting to look back 10 years ago and at the books we had and, and what we have now and um, all talking about how stories make us feel good and hopeful. I am hopeful that we will continue to find new ways of telling really fun stories in a diverse way. I agree with all of it. Want to take it into a slightly different direction. Um, we have society overall is changing very rapidly because we have technological pro progress. I think that Yes, the genre will expand, but I wanted to touch a little bit on the format of the books. Um, we have an audio reader on the, on the panel with us who is much more qualified to talk on, about this than I am, but we have seen an explosion of audio books just in the last 15 years. They just blew up. And um, because it's so interesting because the audio book performance is so transformative and it basically, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's a different experience from the book. 
uh, from reading the book. And then we have also, you know, proliferation of like specifically light novels where you have more illustrations, um, maybe even comic book panels in it. And I think it's very interesting. I think we're going to be seeing a lot more of that to where there's more collaborative effort that goes into the book. Besides it's being just simply text, I think we will see it in different media. I think that there will be a very, very exciting and different developments in it. Um, you know, maybe we'll come to a point where, you know, you click one buy button, you get audiobook, ebook, you know, you get maybe a comic uh, or a light novel together. And it, it's just really interesting to me because the collaboration aspect of it is really fascinating. Yeah, to me, I, I kind of think that, that the, the books change just to reflect society. But I also think with the rise of self-publishing, that's been even more so because when you think about the big publishing companies and there's less and less of them, they're giant corporations. They are conservative slightly by the nature. But when you have self-publishing, someone can put something out there that is different, that is more inclusive, that's a little bit less traditional, yeah. and people can read that. I think that's great. But then, then the bigger companies will be like, oh, this could sell. This could sell, yeah. And they'll do it because they we all want to make money. We saw it a little bit with the, um, the Amazon thing where, uh, you know, we used to... Uh, it used to be a very radical thing when you offered your fiction online as a serial for free, right? I remember when we first did Innkeeper, like a million of very smart people in the field told us, you're idiots. It's now we're never going to sell you, giving it away for free. Why are you doing this? And now we basically have Kindle Vela, which is took the serialized format and all of that comes out of fan fiction. You know, it took the serialized format and is basically allowing people to comment on the chapters as they go along, creative and more interactive experience. You know, people are putting illustrations into the books again, which for for a while just was not done. Uh, it's, it's just interesting. The self-publishing kind of led to this wild, wild west of different formats and ex experiments. And I think it's super exciting. Yeah. I'm psyched about it. Yeah. Yeah, I was I was laughing because I'm like, well, this is exactly what happened to Travis. <laughs> I think there's all kinds of things that are going to change. Um, the genres that I narrate in are kind of doing a lot of these things. So you're talking about serialized fiction. You've got things like Royal Road, where people are doing these ongoing stories that are, at this point are like millions of words. And then they harvest them and they turn them into books in big chunks. But they've already got an audience that they already built for this not actually really edited fiction that ends up getting consumed in like a couple of different ways. Um, people are just, there's such a hunger for fiction at this point that it's starting to get harvested from all these different sources and formats that are not what we're used to. Serialized fiction isn't written anything like a normal book. It doesn't, a chapter doesn't end the same way. The arcs are done differently. It's just, it's planned out and produced very, very differently. We're going to see a lot more of that. Um, and like you were talking about, the, the lack of gatekeeping means that there's a lot more variety in what's going to be put out because of self-publishing, but also like society is changing so much faster than it used to. And with those barriers also coming down, like how fast those changes in society propagate to the books is also going to accelerate. If you read a fantasy book from the 90s, you're almost almost guaranteed you're going to go about halfway through the first four chapters. Something is going to jump out and you're going to be like, wow, that did not hold up. Almost anything written before the 2000s, it already feels like weirdly archaic. And so I just feel like that's going to continue to accelerate. You know, The Fool's Company, right? So oh. it starts, a wonderful series of books, super highly recommend. But it starts with this multi-billionaire who's sitting on the phone. He's like, and he has this magical device that can access internet from anywhere. Yeah. And you can make purchases on it from that? anywhere. And it also doubles as a phone, you know, <laughs> like, and you're reading this, you know, at, at this point, and you're like, ask well, me the to the iPhone, yay. Hitchhiker's <laughs> Guide to the Galaxy. That became basically yeah. the internet before. That became the internet, yeah. It's but just, you know, yeah, you do read something, you go, oh, gosh, this, this, this. Isn't as good as I kind of remember. Don't try to me. watch like the horror movies from the 90s. It's uh, just like, yeah. oh, no, 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 no. Not good. <laughs> yeah, there's some things that might hold up a little bit, but for the most part, you're right. Every, every single thing is like, 
yeah, well, I, don't, I don't know about this. Like, <laughs> just a few pages in. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I totally agree. We, we're seeing a lot more of self-published books that are, that do well and get picked up because they're books that like, like Travis's book, which was like, this is, this book is amazing. Um, and he self-published it. And then Tor was like, yeah, this book is doing really well. We'll pick it up. And I've seen that happen more and more often. Um, and I love it because it's like, you know, this is, this is a whole thing now. Like there's like a whole cozy fantasy genre. Cause everyone's like, we want this. And now publishers are like, okay, <laughs> like clearly this is, there's a, there's a thing that people want that they're not getting. So I, I think that, you know, with, with the rise of things like book talk, uh, which we can have a whole conversation about, um, you know, it, it's highly influencing, um, the industry and for good or for bad. <laughs> right? Um, so I think that, you know, readers continuing to talk in these different ways, um, is, is influencing way more than ever before. Um, like I said, for better, for better, or for worse. I don't know how everyone feels about book talk. I have a love hate relationship with it. <laughs> um, but we have another question um, about tropes. So I'm people are wondering what tropes you gravitate towards in your work, and then what tropes you like to read. Um, and Alona has played on Harlequin tropes for sure. Um, like failed marriage of convenience and all that. And I know all of you have different, different tropes. So, so what are the tropes that you yeah. like? Kissing to avert suspicion, um, only one bed. Uh, and the king of tropes is uh, the fealty relationship between a worthy Lord and his uh, loyal vassal. Like that was the core trope that uh, A Taste of Golden Iron was built around. I was like, this right here is the trope that I'm obsessed with. I need to like pile everything else and build on on those granite foundations um other ones are uh yeah i think like only one bed is probably my second favorite after that that forced proximity mm, mm. i love tropes um some i i've only just realized that that there's like a, thoughts about people not wanting tropes. So I don't know, whatever. But those those are when I'm learning about a book, I'm like, give me all the tropes. Give me the I tropes. Just give me the um, tropes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I I the more the merrier. Um mine Wonder Window has and some of obviously my favorites because they're in it. Um things like enemies to lovers, reluctant allies, fake dating. Um and then just world worldy tropes are like Centennial or not Centennial? Well, wow. Sentinel like forests and like things lurking that you don't know are there, but they're like you know some like gothic fantasy tropes. But most of which that I gravitate towards as a reader are the romance ones. And yeah, yeah, they're so good. I love tropes. <laughs> Oi, tropes. I think you know because we started sort of in. Um... The, like with the Kate Daniel series, so our trope was sort of that, uh, you know, urban fantasy, smart ass. Yeah. You and know, trope or cliche. I'm not sure. At this point, probably cliche. Yeah. I mean, uh, by, now, <laughs> by now it's cliche. By now it's cliche. Yeah. It was a trope. Um, we did um, Enemies to Lovers. Yeah. Did, enemies um, to Lovers. We, um, let's see. The, I guess if you really, so if you really look at the uh, Kinsman, Kinsman is actually designed, every single like novella in it is designed to kind of mess with Harlequin tropes. So like we did the, his deadly secretary, um, we did the um, arranged marriage, and then the last one we did the fated maids, um, which was just completely... We have to do like a secret... Like a millionaire secret baby. Yeah, we did not do a secret baby We're yet. So that, that would be like, I am not sure how. But we I want have... the same sex couple to have that. And you, she's like, you can't do that. And I'm like, yes, well, like we could figure out a way though. I you could figure that out, right? <laughs> could we not? Yeah, we can. We may have to. We we have we have a same sex couple in the um I, in I the faded blaze. And... Have a secret baby. And yeah. if the baby could do, be a millionaire, that's even better. <laughs> right there. Yeah, I'll do it. What about you, Travis? We only have like maybe three minutes left. 
Um, so, I mean, I like, I, 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 I didn't write with awareness of them, but they got them pointed out to me retroactively. I obviously like, you know, there's only one bed, um, bathing of the wounds, um, the warrior putting their, you know, martial past behind them. Um, this is, and, and anything to do with found family, clearly. Um, those, those are probably the big ones that obviously bubbled up for me. Yes. For sure. Well, um, I guess to uh, to end this, um, do y'all have any like quick book recommendations? And what are you working on now that we can look forward to? <laughs> I've been waiting for someone to ask me this yeah, question. So. Um, my eternal book rec is, of course, The Hands of the Emperor by Victoria Goddard. It's about a, uh, bu a bureaucrat, career bureaucrat, and his beloved emperor, and they institute universal basic income in this fantasy setting and uh, fall in friendship together. Uh, and it is one of those, like going back to what I said about like books that have the romance structure without being a like sexual love story, like this is a queer platonic relationship. And um, I love it. It is my favorite book ever, hands down. If I go on any longer, I'll start frothing at the mouth. So I'll pass it over to someone else. I, Rachel's holding one. Yeah, I was, I, I was ready. Um, the trilogy is just out now, but this is the first one. It's Half a Soul by Olivia Atwater. And it's so cozy. It's a Regency fae um, cozy fantasy. And yeah, it's just, oh, just 10 out of 10. <laughs> Um, I really like Take Kingfisher, uh, Paladin's Grace. It's kind of like awkward middle-aged relationship with also some decapitations. Um, I also really liked Nettle and Bone. It's not as heavy on the romance, but I, it's got some of that to it. And I just really like the way that she tells stories. Plus, it has a dog made out of bones and a demon chicken. So, plus 10. Love that book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to vote for Jennifer Estep's new book. It is uh, Only Bad Options. I have the ARC. It is awesome. Um, I think you should check it out. Do you have any, Gordon? Ah, you know, I read a lot of stuff on Comixology. Ooh, yeah. mm -hmm. And a lot of it is Garth Ennis. And I don't know if no. I'm comfortable recommending no. him. No, not for I'm his kind panel. of not. <laughs> <laughs> also, he reads, okay, uh, he reads a lot of like Bigfoot. Oh, yeah, I read a lot Big of Bigfoot. Where, yeah. oh, what about that really good werewolf book you read? It's not a romance, oh, though. Um, what is it? Mongrels. Um, Mongrels, yeah. It's a book about werewolves. Cool. It's new, new, but it's a really good book about werewolves, a different kind of werewolves. Yeah. Uh, that one's good. There's also a book about military like mercenary ex-soldiers who turn into werewolves and fight bigfoot that's a real genre that's awesome <laughs> like, I, I, like I, have, I have now seen every single bigfoot documentary you have there not, ever actually, watched yes you, you have he puts them on falls asleep and You've then i'm the like <laughs> they're 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 you know and it's always so so misleading it's like finding <laughs> bigfoot it's not finding it's looking there's never any finding occurring there's just looking and looking in the woods and there's like no big foot ever there's no hea no there's no hea well we need to we need to end so that the next panel i know the panels are back to back today but thank you all so so much for being here having thank this conversation having thank, thank you everyone thank thank for you. watching you. please go and buy these authors books there is a link that says buy books at the bottom um, or buy from your local indie bookstore, um, which is a great place to buy books and get recommendations, uh, no matter where you are. And thank you all so much um, for doing thank this. Thank you. Really great. And thanks for allowing the Bookstore Romance Day to host this panel. Uh, and thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for having us. Yeah.